Madam Chair, the meeting is live now. Madam Chair, I assume you're muted. I, can you hear me now? I think we're good. So good afternoon, uh, committee members, and good afternoon, HRM staff and visitors. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. And let me begin by acknowledging that we are in the Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We recognize the peace and friendship treaties signed between the British Crown and the Mi'kma'ki. We are all treaty people, and we have rights and responsibilities as Mi'kmaq and settlers alike. But this afternoon, we're especially mindful of the residential school survivors and their descendants, as they remember again the pain of the residential school experience for so many people. So the first order of business is the approval of the minutes. And uh, I'm wondering if someone could uh, make a motion with regard to the minutes. If, are there any errors or omissions? There being none, I look for an order uh, or a motion to approve the minutes as circulated. I will make a little motion. I'll second that. So moved by Christine Yang and seconded by Lisa Blackburn that the minutes be uh, accepted as amend or as uh, circulated. And all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. I mean, the motion then has carried. The next item is the approval of the order of business and approval of any additions or deletions. Are there any uh, requests for any change to the order of the agenda as it was circulated? Yes, Madam Chair, it's Lisa. Yes. Uh, just wondering if we could uh, move item 9.2.3, the update on regional council to uh, after uh, item 9.1.3 under reports and discussion. Uh, I have an appointment uh, that uh, requires that I leave by uh, 510. So uh, I just wanna be able to uh, give the council report before I take off and uh, thinking that uh, sliding uh, that into uh, after 9.1.3 will probably uh, allow the time required. Okay. Um... Haruka, I believe I need a motion for that, correct? Uh, just the motion to approve the uh, order of business as amended is required. Okay. So, uh, uh, Lisa, perhaps you could make a motion to um, uh, that we accept sure. the agenda as, as amended? Sure thing. I move that we approve the order of business and uh, as, uh, as amended. A seconder for that motion? I'll second. Seconded by Holly. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed indicate by saying nay. Motion is carried. So that's All what right. we will do, Lisa. We'll uh, hear your Thank report. You. After Thank nine. you, Madam Chair and committee. Uh, is there any business arising out of the minutes? Uh, there being none, then I call for a declaration of conflicts of interest. You've seen the agenda, you know what's, uh, what's coming. And uh, does anyone have any uh, conflict of interest that they would like to declare at this time? No, then uh, we'll move on. Item six is consideration of any deferred business and there is none. Then that takes us on to item seven, which is correspondence. And you will have received in your uh, packet a letter uh, that was received from Jody Brown asking us for support on the period poverty in Nova Scotia. So uh, with regard to this item, we have uh, four options for our action. We can either receive that bit of correspondence and take no action, or we can receive it and reply with certain notes, or we could forward it to staff for their consideration or information, or we could discuss it further at another meeting. What's your will on this particular item? Um, I watched her YouTube 
her YouTube video and I think she raised a great point that I've personally thought of myself. I don't know what we as a committee should do next, but it's definitely um, something that I've thought about a lot, especially growing up um, and even now currently of having period products in schools for free um, and other options that we could absolutely be doing. Yeah. So at writing a letter of support is really beyond the, um, beyond the scope of our committee. Um, we can certainly provide support individually. And, uh, oh, sorry, um, Lily, you're wanting to speak on this. I, yeah, it's, I guess I also echo Mallory that I think this is really important work and I, but I don't really know how directly we can support it as a committee because the bills that mentioned in the letter are, are provincial bills. Um, so I, I mean, it would be great if we could, but it's kind of yeah, outside of what we can do as a committee. But I wonder if, because I know like some, like the public libraries, um, at least the central library has free menstrual products in the bathrooms. So I wonder if there is some way that we could like move this work forward in terms of like municipal belt, like making a recommendation or, or forwarding it on to staff or council in terms of like advocating for um, free menstrual products in municipal buildings. I'm not sure. Also, I just, while I'm talking, I want to apologize that my roof is being done. So there will be loud noises when I'm speaking, but I didn't really have anywhere else to go because of COVID. So I had to stay at home. <laughs> but uh, so hopefully it's not too distracting. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. So perhaps it might make sense for us to um, have uh, the staff, the, the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion staff, uh, consider this um, for information at this point in time? Agreed. I think that's a, a good uh, plan of action. I'm just trying to uh, look up a, uh, I thought we had asked for a report on that for uh, Free menstrual products in all uh, HRM facilities, and uh, if I uh, if I find it, I will send it along. I think Caroline would like to speak to this. Yes, Councillor Blackburn, I believe that that has already begun. Uh, free menstrual products in mm -hmm. HRM facilities. I think that something that's uh, happened last fall was the implementation. I don't know how widely it's being done, though. Okay, Christine, you would like to speak to this. Uh, yes, uh, so um, I think uh, last December, uh, the municipality announced that the free menstrual product will be available. I'm wondering if uh, we can connect uh, her with the staff and then can share the current kind of, kind of give a report, like a kind of give a current situation uh, to this individual. And then uh, I'm wondering like a, uh, is a way we can connect her with the provincial level, but I don't know if that will be out of uh, our main day. Yeah. So perhaps uh, at this point, the, the best uh, course of action is to, um, to refer it to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and they can um, uh, investigate a little more and tell us uh, you know, what, what progress they've made and uh, uh, we could just uh, reply to the uh, writer of the letter that that's what we're going to do at this point. Um, Lily, you wanted to add something here? Oh, I was just going to suggest that we reply and say that that was what we were doing, um, sure. but you just suggested that. So yeah. that's why I lowered my hand. But I think, yeah, I think it would be great for the um, person to hear back from us as a committee. Sure. Yeah. So. Okay, so I'll take that. Uh, I will uh, communicate uh, to, to her on behalf of our committee and we will ask the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to uh, kind of um, look into this and, and, and to also let us know what, what they're able to do. Does that sound okay? All right. Uh, so next item on the agenda is uh, petitions, no petitions that I'm aware of, um, presentations, none that I'm aware of, any information items being brought forward, uh, none that I'm aware of. And so that brings us to item 9.1.1, which is the regional plan review. 
And I think we have Kathleen here ready to uh, help us um, walk through this, uh, this regional plan review. And um, we will have an opportunity to give her feedback. Uh, we'll do that in the, in the way that we've done in many meetings. We'll go alphabetically around the table and you'll have a couple of minutes to ask her questions or make comments. Uh, and the end goal of it are, uh, we're gonna spend about 70 minutes on this today, maybe a bit more. Uh, the end goal will be for us to be somewhat close to a point where we can prepare a written response to the uh, regional review committee. Uh, and that may happen uh, after some, at some point after this meeting or after the July meeting. So Kathleen, welcome. Kathleen is a um, planner with the Regional Planning and Development Office. I think I have that correct. And you do. she's going to lead us through this conversation. And my, um, my job here, Kathleen, is just to keep us on time. Sounds good. I'm going to see if I can figure out technology very quickly. <laughs> um, and then we can get going. Um, can everybody see my presentation? Uh, yes, I can. Yes. I don't know about others. Perfect. <laughs> um, so if there are any technical issues, please just uh, let me know. Um, but today, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, today, I'm going to just try to speak to you guys briefly about uh, our regional plan review and more specifically uh, the themes and directions report. Um, so while I have the pleasure of leading this presentation today, um, I wanted to give you a quick idea of the group, the team that has been working on this project and particularly proud to bring this committee or this group uh, to this committee because uh, we have an all female team working on our regional plan review. Um, normally, uh, if we were meeting in person, you would see all of us sort of behind the presenter, um, but we wanted to put some faces to the names. Uh, so this is the team that has been uh, working on this uh, this. Uh, initiative. In addition, we do have a, uh, this, this work does cross across a variety of municipal departments. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge the work uh, and help that we've received from uh, staff members across HRM. So to give you an idea of uh, what I'm going to be discussing, we're gonna talk about why we're here, uh, what the themes and directions are, um, how we are going to be engaging, and uh, in consultation with the chair, we've also identified two themes that we're going to do a bit of a deeper dive on. Uh, so those are theme five, which is social planning for community well-being, and theme seven, uh, which is integrated uh, community facilities and parks. Uh, just to give you uh, some warning, we are going to go over all of the themes, uh, given that uh, this committee's purview is so broad, uh, but uh, we'll do a deeper dive on, on these two. So we're here today because Regional Council initiated the review of the Regional Plan in February of 2020. So this means that we're going to be evaluating our land use policies and making sure that they represent the direction that we would like to see them go. We are contemplating how the municipality is physically organized and growing. Uh, the themes and directions document, uh, which is the first major deliverable of this work, was released on May 20th, and we are looking for feedback. To give you a little bit of context, uh, the regional plan is a strategic document. It was first uh, adopted uh, in 2006 and it provides a region-wide vision for land use. It's uh, a comprehensive outline on how growth and development will take place between 2006 and 2031. For this type of plan, we try to uh, do, conduct a review every five years. Uh, for this plan, the first review was completed in 2014. Um, so this represents the second review of the plan. Um, and we're hoping to have the updated plan go through the adoption process in 2022. Um, the plan that we come up with through this work will uh, essentially be the guide until the end of the plan's life, which is in 2031. 
this project has been sort of divided into three major phases. The first was doing, uh, obviously, the initiation of the project, doing a great deal of research, um, doing some engagement with key stakeholders and internal groups. Uh, and then coming forward with our themes and directions document. So this document is now phase two. We're gonna be engaging on, on its content and talking to all of the committees. Uh, and it will the feedback that we receive will inform the draft of the actual amendments and policies that we put forward. Um, we'll then do another huge batch of engagement on those uh, before, to make sure that we uh, have listened and are, are going in the right direction. And then we will bring the, the final plan forward for approval sometime in 2022. So the themes and directions document, as I mentioned, it was released on May 20th and it shares the key planning ideas, the issues at play, and it outlines the potential changes that we will be making. It really documents the scope of the work and gives us a chance to ask if we are heading in the right direction. Um, we also identified some issues uh, that were of particular relevance to the review uh, and decided that in addition to the themes and directions report, we'd also uh, publish these issue papers, which provide just a little bit more context on these specific uh, topics. So uh, because we are living in a COVID world and have to rely largely on online engagement, we are very much uh, focused on providing a, a range of opportunities for people to participate, including uh, our uh, website, which is shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash regional dot dash plan. Um, and that provides a huge amount of information as well as opportunities for engagement. But we are also listening through more traditional method, methods such as email and phone. And as a result of you know, having limited ability to, to go to people, we are bringing this, uh, this project forward to all of the advisory committees uh, and uh, boards uh, that we have access to. Um, so this is sort of the first stop. So today, obviously, we're going to be listening uh, and taking notes to get your feedback. We also, uh, as the chair mentioned, uh, invite the committee to take some time and follow up with a written submission if you would like to provide uh, additional comments as a group. Um, but you're also all welcome individually to visit the project website, to complete surveys, uh, participate in events, and uh, provide comments as individuals. And uh, we strongly support and encourage you sharing this, uh, this information uh, with your networks uh, to help get the word out. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into themes five and seven, but uh, just wanted to give you a quick overview of each of the individual themes. Um, so the first is theme one, which is considering the regional scale first. So essentially that what this means is taking a look at our region, um, sort of zooming out, not just our, our neighborhood or our community, but the entire region and seeing where it makes sense for growth to be um, directed. We're going to conduct population and housing growth analysis to see what the demand is for housing in our, in our uh, municipality. We're going to be taking a look at the service boundary uh, and also at you know, future service communities and locations for growth to go. go. We're going to review the urban reserve designation, which are lands that have been identified as potential future uh, locations for growth and see whether or not those, uh, can, see if conditions have changed and whether or not they're still appropriate. And in particular, we are going to be lifting the urban reserve designation from the Acoma lands uh, to allow for uh, master neighborhood planning and development in those in, on that in those lands. Theme two is around building healthier and more complete communities. Um, so you're all likely very familiar with center plan, which provided secondary planning for the regional center. Uh, similar work is going to be taking place for suburban areas under the suburban plan and then rural areas under the rural plan. Um, so we are going to set a little bit of preliminary direction for those projects through this work. We're going to be also taking a look at where uh, growth centers have been located in suburban and rural areas and see if they are still appropriate, uh, if other places make more sense based on where services are located, um, things like that. Um, we're going to also provide some policy guidance for applica development applications uh, in the suburban area and review conservation design policies. And those are the policies that guide uh, more rural development. Theme three is reconsidering employment and in industrial lands. Um, so looking at employment trends modeling, uh, as well as obviously COVID-19 has had a huge impact on uh, employment in, in our region. 
uh, but also ensuring that we have an adequate supply of industrial lands uh, and then also looking at rural economic development and what its needs are. Theme four is around transforming how we move in our region. Uh, so we're going to be taking a lot of direction from the integrated mobility plan, which was completed uh, and taking its recommendations and designing policy to support transit oriented development, which essentially means putting our growth along corridors where transit is either located or is planned. We're going to update our mode share targets based on our how we've actually grown and we're going to respond to requests and concerns around uh, the urban transit service boundary, which is, you know, how far uh, buses run, as well as uh, rural mobility uh, and, uh, and how people are getting around in those communities. As I mentioned, I'm skipping theme five. Uh, it's not a typo, I promise. <laughs> but theme six is celebrating culture and heritage. Uh, so this will be uh, implementing the recommendations of sharing our stories, which is a plan that is currently ongoing. Um, we're anticipating that it's going to be wrapped up within the time frame of our review. Uh, so we'll have the opportunity to take its recommendations and turn them into policy around celebrating and preserving culture and heritage. Um, we're also going to do a variety of uh, policy, uh, a, a range of policy work to support the Heritage Property Program, which is the program that deals with registered heritage properties, uh, heritage conservation districts, and cultural landscapes. Skipping theme seven uh, to theme eight, which is enhancing environmental protection. Uh, so through this, we're going to be developing uh, programs of study based on the recommendations of the Halifax Green Network Plan. So we're going to take a look at obviously wildlife corridors and how how the Green Network has been uh, can be preserved in our in our community, uh, as well as our ability to protect environmentally sensitive lands um, and watercourses, wetlands, and coastal areas. And looking at how we allow development currently and 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 what we can do to to better protect these lands. Theme nine is leading through action on climate. Uh, so this will be uh, around uh, implementing the recommendations of Halifax um, and uh, using those recommendations that are related to land use uh, and implementing them through the regional plan. Um, so uh, in particular, you know, studying uh, climate risks and community preparedness and all of the things that are related to land use and climate as well as considering um, how we have policy around alternate energy systems. Theme 10 is about uh, the future. So as I mentioned, this is going to be the last regional plan review before we do a huge revamp of the regional plan. Um, so this is gonna be guiding us to 2031. So this is about what comes after that, planning for 2030 to 2050. And finally, uh, theme 11, we wouldn't be able to ignore the impact of COVID-19 that it has had on all of these various topics that we're discussing. Um, I think that at this point, we are still too close to the pandemic to say what the impacts are going to be, but we need to know, uh, or need to establish a framework to start to track these over time so that we can consider them uh, in our work as we move forward. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the chair uh, has indicated that we will talk about sort of those other themes uh, afterwards, but uh, I'll, I'll continue into theme five right now and we can discuss them later. Um, and theme five is social planning for community well-being. So uh, in April, 2020, HRM adopted the social policy administrative order which aims to strengthen community health and well-being, enhance equity and inclusion, and build on social assets and community capacity. So through this project, we're going to be looking at how we can incorporate a social lens into all of our planning work uh, and create new policy that will help support these types of initiatives. So uh, probably uh, one of the bigger co topics of conversation we've had is around housing. Uh, as Halifax continues to grow and develop, housing affordability has become an increasing issue. Um, the municipality's role in affordable housing has been developing uh, as obviously the province is sort of seen as uh, the main governing body responsible for affordable housing. But we're starting to realize that we have a role to play in this as well. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work in recent years uh, and have come up with a few things that we need to do through the regional plan review to help to support and move forward with affordable housing initiatives. So the first is to look at our policies and make sure that we're encouraging a diver diverse range of housing forms. Uh, 
We're going to identify if we have any planning tools available so that when redevelopment happens, there's no loss of affordable housing. We're going to update our housing needs assessment on an annual basis because this document provides us with a lot of information that is very important to help us make informed decisions. We're going to remove barriers to the development and retention of affordable housing. Uh, we're going to look at possible tools to leverage municipally owned surplus or available lands to support uh, affordable housing initiatives and develop a region wide density bonusing program, which would essentially allow for uh, community benefits uh, such as affordable housing or open space uh, in exchange for additional development rights. Uh, food security is also uh, of relevance to this. Uh, so it is estimated that between one in five and one in seven households in HRM experience food insecurity. Uh, we have been working with the Food Policy Alliance to develop Just Food, which is a program centered on food justice and working together towards a region where no one is hungry, where food and people are celebrated, and our local food system is prosperous and sustainable. So this program essentially gave us a set of tools and recommendations uh, for the consideration of food equity while we are when we are making decisions. Um, so through the regional plan review, we're going to direct the use of the just food tools uh, when looking at creating or updating our policies, as well as removing uh, any potential barriers in policy toward for uh, establishing food uses. So this is both agricultural land for local food, uh, but also food markets, uh, grocery stores, those kinds of things. Going to see what our policy says right now and see if it can be improved to better support these uses. Um, inclusivity, inclusivity and public participation is obviously a huge uh, work that we are going to be undertaking um, in order for us to have uh, complete and healthy communities they need to, uh, we need to understand the lived experience of all of the residents who live in them. Um, we need to continue to understand the, the effect of our existing policies uh, on historically underserved and underrepresented groups and work with them to uh, better support these communities. Um, so in our work, we have uh, established a diversity and inclusion office as a municipality uh, and their staff are wonderful. And uh, we are going to, uh, through this review, uh, recommend the engage that they be engaged as a resource during uh, planning projects so that additional perspectives can be considered and that uh, engagement is uh, planned in, a, uh, in an appropriate manner for to uh, allow for all of the members of the community, community to participate. We're also looking at or developing a uh, public engagement guidebook, which is going to help us to uh, better engage with our various communities. Uh, and certainly there is an emphasis on uh, making sure that engagement uh, is accessible to all and, uh, and does not, uh, does not uh, alienate any members of the community. Community partnerships. Um, we have several uh, initiatives and commitments to better partner with, serve, and represent underrepresented communities. Um, so, uh, obviously, the most uh, obvious examples are the Task Force on Commemoration of Edward Cornwallis and the Recognition of Commemoration and Commemoration of Indigenous History, as well as the approval of the African Nova Scotian Road to Economic Prosperity. So, these two uh, initiatives have resulted in a large number of recommendations, and where those recommendations are related to land use, we are going to ensure that our policies are consistent with them. Um, and, and make sure that they're updated accordingly. And finally, uh, accessibility. 15% um, of the world's population lives with some form of impairment or disability, and they face barriers that prevent them from achieving their full and equitable part participation in society. Uh, so in HRM, we have uh, a variety of resources to try to help to better, uh, to, to make our, our communities more accessible, uh, but uh, certainly we still have policies that need to be updated and practices that need to be updated. So we are going to be reviewing and updating planning documents to bring HRM closer to the goal of being a city for people of all abilities, ages, and backgrounds, and include the Accessibility Advisory Committee and the Diversity and Inclusion Office uh, when we come forward with our uh, engagement guidebook to ensure that uh, their perspectives are considered when we're, when we're working through uh, those proposed uh, changes to how we engage. So I'll take a break now and stop sharing, but I believe that uh, 
Madam Chair was going to lead us through some questions. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's great. Thank you, Kathleen. That's uh, very um, quick, but a uh, very comprehensive review of that theme. And, um, and so now, um, committee members, um, if you have comments and questions, that's, this is your opportunity. And we'll start, we'll start with Hanin. Hi, thank you for that, Kathleen. That was wonderful. Um, I guess with the, the social planning, with the social lens to new policies, and I think when you were talking about theme four, this came up um, as well. With transportation, I think with a social lens to that would be a part of making that safer and a part of making that a bit more inclusive, both accessible towards people who have uh, disabilities of any kind and towards women. Um, so I don't know, is that part of the social lens that you were recommending or? So, um, and I'll invite any of my colleagues who are also on this call to jump in uh, with their thoughts. But uh, initially in terms of transportation, uh, the regional plan is, is ultimately a land use document. Um, so we're not really going to be getting in so far as you know how road, road standards and things like that are all sort of outside of our purview as well as like transit and <laughs> how they operate are all a little bit outside of our scope. Um, but certainly what we're looking at through the social lens or through the social policy section is adding that social lens to everything that we do when we're creating policy. Um, so I think there definitely could be some impact, but we'd have to continue to work with the various groups that are actually responsible for transportation to sort of bring that forward. Great, thank you. I, I could hop in as well. Um, uh, the chair would permit. Sure. Um, yes, go ahead. My Leah. name is so Leah Perrin, also uh, with regional planning. Um, yeah, I'm a principal ahead, planner with, with regional planning, and um, I am aware. So, our, our, the integrated mobility plan is the um, municipality's um, sort of key guiding uh, priority plan for transportation work. And uh, there is an integrated mobility plan uh, working group, uh, sort of across across the departmental team. Um, and one of the things I know that they've been working on recently has been uh, looking at an equity lens that they sort of identified after the integrated mobility plan was adopted that it's sort of missing that equity piece that the integrated mobility plan doesn't really speak to equity specifically. But I know that there is sort of a subgroup of the broader working group that's kind of um, thinking about those issues. So yes, yeah, certainly uh, it's, on, it's on top of mind. Thank you. Thanks. Lily, how about, would you like to make some comments or have questions? Yes, I do. Um, I also did some reading before the, uh, through these themes. So um, I have a couple questions. My largest is I, that I noticed in the, the social inclusion comp uh, theme that there was no discussion of engaging an advisor on 2SLGBTQ issues for the city, but there were for other marginalized communities. And um, I was wondering why that is and what work is being done to support uh, queer and trans folks in Halifax, because, you know, our community is still faced with so much violence and inaccessible services um, and just open discrimination in the city. So I think, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that all planning and policy is, is safe and accessible for queer folks. Absolutely, uh, and I agree with you completely on this. Um, so the reason that LGBTQ um, community is not referenced in our in our list of resources is because as of right now, the Office of Inclusive, Inc uh, oh my gosh, I've been saying, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion uh, does not currently have a representative for that group. Um, so in the effort to be transparent, they, they did recommend removing that uh, from our section of the report. Um, I believe that this is something that obviously their office is still very interested in uh, expanding their work to. Um, I'm not going to speak on their behalf because I don't know what the what the status of that is. Um, but uh, it was flagged as something that we were going to discuss. Uh, and then when we didn't have the resource at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we decided to remove it. But definitely take your point and, and agree with you fully. Well, thanks, Lily, for that question. Anything else? Anything further? Are you good? Um, I guess, yeah, I, if there's time for me to ask another question, I do have uh, 
but um, I also don't want to take up too much time. So. Okay, so we'll go around and if there's time, we'll come back to you for okay. a second question. Uh, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And actually, if I can just uh, follow up on uh, Lily's uh, question, um, and just to put a bit more context in there, uh, diversity inclusion did uh, request funding for uh, an LGBTQ plus advisor for diversity and inclusion in budget, and it was approved. So it's my understanding that they are moving forward with that uh, currently. I don't know how far they're getting in, you know, in the hiring process because of COVID, but uh, it was definitely uh, given the uh, the green light at uh, at budget. So uh, I think that's a that's a vacancy that uh, that is going to be filled sooner rather than later. Um, Kathleen, thank you so very very much. Uh, this, uh, this actually, uh, I'm not a policy gal, but this kind of makes me giddy because you hit on all the stuff that I've been thinking about since coming to council and uh, uh, love your theme for urban transit service boundary. And this is my chance to put in my plug for Lucasville. We want to see buses out in Lucasville. Thank you. Um, a couple of quick questions. Just wondering about uh, uh theme eight and wondering if the the plan is to fold the green network plan into the regional plan that's question one um and then uh you mentioned the public engagement guidebook uh and removing barriers for that is that uh, is that guidebook going to be published in a couple of different languages um with uh, regard to housing i'm wondering uh, how much of a boost we got this week from the uh, Provincial Affordable Housing Report and Recommendations uh, and whether that's gonna make your job easier going forward. And uh, finally, um, with regards to COVID, Theme 11, just wondering, you know, how much fear do you and the team have that uh, the work that you're doing now and have been doing uh, for, you know, the better part of a, a year or so, how, how much of that could be upended by COVID and just the, the big question mark that COVID puts over everything. Um, and that's, uh, and that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's, that's several questions. Go for it, Kathleen. <laughs> I'll try my best. I'll, I'll try to remember all of them. Um, in terms of theme four, uh, or sorry, it was, it was green network plan was the first one. So yes, this is very much the, 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 um, main way in which we are going to be implementing some of the recommendations of the green network plan. Um, as another part of my role, I'm actually responsible for the implementation of that plan. So very much aware of what it recommends and making sure that it ends up in the, in these policies. Um, but the Green Network Plan also was a very high level document uh, that provided some very large recommendations. So we're, our work is going to be focusing on sort of doing additional study to bring them down to the ground level uh, and make them a little bit more applicable um, and, and, and enforceable is the other thing. So uh, certainly that is, that is something that we are looking at through uh, this, uh, this work. Um, in terms of the affordable housing announcement, I am not going to speak on that because I believe that um, my colleague Jill has a bunch, far more information. I'm not sure if Leah can maybe provide an update on that. Um, but certainly in response to COVID as well, we have, uh, I, I think the whole team can sort of back me up when I say that uh, we had just sort of started work on the themes and directions when COVID hit, and we had about a month or two of just panic of what we were doing, trying to plan for the future when it was so uncertain. I think that um, at this point, yeah, certainly there are a lot of things that can change. Um, we've, we've mentioned employment, uh, but, you know, immigration is going to be a really big factor in whether or not our city continues to grow at the rate that it is. And if that demand for housing at that results from a larger population is going to continue. Um, but as I mentioned, it's still too, still too soon for us to say what that impact is going to be. Um, so we're proceeding right now uh, with um, some, some high level assumptions, but it's definitely top of mind. Um, and I cannot remember your fourth question and I'm very sorry. Oh, yeah, no, no, no worries. The, uh, the public engagement guidebook, just wondering if that's yes. going to be published in a few languages. So, um, that's something I can look into. My understanding of the public engagement guidebook is that it's actually more of like an internal tool that staff would be using oh. when they're developing their okay. approach to, uh, to developing engagement. So if you're dealing with a planning application, this guidebook will be how you plan, when you're going to meet, how you meet, how you engage with the community. Gotcha. Um, so it will be less of an outward facing document, but yeah. yeah. 
No, that was, sorry, my mistake. I thought that was more of a public document. No, much appreciated. Thank you very no much. I can also respond to the affordable housing question if uh, the chair uh, or counselor wishes. I'm Kate Green. I'm the regional yeah. policy program manager. So part yes, of the go team. ahead. Go ahead, Kate. Thanks. Okay, thanks. So uh, there, there is a commission working on affordable housing that has been pulled together by uh, the provincial government and they announced their report and recommendations uh, this week. And it does affect our work. It's forward thinking, you know, we feel positively about the information. I think part of what it says is there's probably an increased role that municipalities can play in delivering housing. And, um, you know, they certainly are saying we need to invest in housing immediately. We can create, if we invest $25 million today, we can create 900, uh, you know, units for people who are, uh, you know, in core housing need. Uh, but it does identify that it requires all sectors, all levels of government to work together to really house people securely. Um, it identifies housing as a right, uh, which is really critical. And um, so, you know, it's, it's saying a lot of the right things. For everyone on the committee, what we're looking to, we're currently huh, writing a report on housing governance that stems from an earlier motion of regional council. And that is asking us to look at the municipality's role and the role that we want to play going forward in housing governance. So do we want to more in actually delivering and building housing, not just, you know, regulating housing, which is what we do through land use, but do we want to play an increased role in that? So that housing governance report will be coming forward um, in the late summer, I think. And we're, we are participating in that and looking to that for um, to come forward to council to give us direction on the municipal role and how it might change over time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that update. Yeah, thank you, Kate. Uh, we'll move on. Uh, Tanya Boudreau, would you like to make comments or ask questions? Yeah, um, my questions um, might be nitty gritty. So I'll start with kind of a general one. Um, in, there's uh, relating to affordable housing. I know there are some definitions out there. In, in fact, one that was included on our meeting um, that really kind of laid out what affordable housing is and who it applies to and who gets to take advantage of it. Um, but within um, this plan, will we take it uh, take into consideration um, different people's needs um, relating to affordable housing, such as um, ensuring that women or people with children um, have access to affordable housing. Not that everyone doesn't af deserve affordable housing, but we know that women with children or families with children might be impacted differently um, based on biases and stereotypes out there. Um, so is there a way that we can include them so that they have uh, a, some form of uh, better access or more advanced access through either um, an application process or through uh, housing programs to ensure that they get the housing that they require without kind of that stigma attached? Or is that too nitty gritty? It's, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting yeah. question. Sorry, I'll, take, I'll let you take this, Kate, because you probably have a better answer than me. <laughs> I don't know if I have a better answer, but it's just something we've been thinking about in the housing file. So um, I don't know if, you know, we sort of, when we look at housing, we don't, um, we have to be careful that we're not discriminating in how we enable that housing. So we often look to all ages and abilities, all people, everyone deserves a right for secure housing. But I think how we've been thinking about women and how it relates to housing is, you know, uh, housing over the past number of years has been geared towards, you know, the single, the, a, a traditional family structure. And that's really um, an outdated view of housing. So we have new people coming into our community, large families who want to live together. We have more single people. We have women who are living longer, who are living on their own. Their partner may have passed away. They might not have the capacity to live on their own, but can still live independently. So how are we creating housing for those people making sure there are no barriers in our housing um, regulations um, in how we, how we set the housing um, uh, system up. So I think what we've been focused on is a different piece of work called the secondary suites um, 
affordable housing uh, secondary suites report, which enabled secondary suites to be built in sort of every residential area across the municipality. So that was recently approved by council, I think it was in last September. And, you know, that creates, a, we call it gentle density or new form of housing um, and community-based housing. Um, the other thing we've been focused on and we're doing right now is a, something called shared housing. So that um, creates an opportunity to have new forms of ownership, you know, maybe co-ops or shared housing or allows different people to come together and um, participate in housing in a different way than one person owning the home and renting to others beneath it. Everyone can kind of have a, 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 a kind of a, a way of owning or participating in the house, but then sharing common facilities like a kitchen. Um, so it creates a, a different structure and a different way of participating, I guess, in, in housing. Thanks, Kate. Um, Charla's got her hand up and you're next, Charla, for comments and questions. So over to you. Um, so my question is related to, to um, you spoke to the governance of the housing um, and, and also the development of the housing. Uh, and what that looks like, but um, has anyone given any consideration that um, people of color, um, black and indigenous people, um, sometimes want to stay in their own communities and have their attachment to the community and culture? So I understand that um, sometimes affordable housing looks like, um, you know, the developments we're used to seeing everybody's clumped together. I think there should be more consideration given to the development of housing, but within our own communities with culture attached to it so that black and indigenous people have a better sense of home. Um, for me personally, growing up, I had a stable home, but I had friends um, because my mother's indigenous and my father is black, that they were sort of clumped together. And I don't think that that's part of the solution to continue that view or that lens. So has any consideration been given to um, that development of housing within the communities uh, on their terms and culture. That's a very interesting question, and I'll I'll let uh, my other colleagues sort of provide their thoughts afterwards. I think um, for me, I think that it's definitely a lens that we need to incorporate into the planning work that we do. Um, part of the work that we've sort of planned for this project already is around sort of diversity of options so that if you are in your community and your housing situation changes that there are options for you within your community that are different um, but still being very respectful of what the community actually wants to see happen in their in their in their location so i think that there are um opportunities for working with community when developing planning policy uh, that that are more reflective of the local cult culture that need to happen. Uh, and that's a lens that we're going to try to incorporate into our work. Um, but Kate, Leah, I'm not sure if you guys have anything to add to that. Sure, I, I think we're just at the edges of starting to have that lens and, um, you know, we've been working um, closely with our, our diversity and inclusion office and our African um, and CEO, our African Nova Scotian Affairs Office. I can't remember all the uh, acronyms today, but uh, the folks in our team who are working with African Nova Scotian communities. And uh, the Road to Economic Prosperity identifies a tool called Community Benefit Agreements. And it identifies that there is a need to build um, a focus uh, on in our planning frameworks on from basically an Afrocentric place from an African Nova Scotian place. So thinking about um, it from a community level first, often our planning framework come in and we have this big view and we have this top down view <laughs> and, and we're, we're still doing that. We're still in the middle of doing that, but we're trying to learn and change how we do that and work the community up. Um, so I, these community benefit agreements or community action plans, we've been doing this work in Beachville. It's a start, it's a bit of a pilot for us, but we started a planning process there where we're really looking at the, from the community's perspective, uh, um, studying where their boundary is, where they would like their boundary to be, studying what they want to um, see their community become. So kind of actually looking at the rules that are in place in that physical community 
and trying to change them from and working directly with the residents association there. So I think we see that tool, uh, if other African Nova Scotian communities are interested as a way of um, doing the kind of applying the kind of lens you're suggesting. Thanks, Kate, and thanks, Charla, for that question. Mallory, comments or questions? Uh, no questions. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Looking forward to part two. Uh, and Holly. Yeah, um, I have a comment and then I have a couple of questions, but I'll just pick one <laughs> important one, I think. Um, so my comment is just, um, I really appreciate the um, idea of the complete community. Um, just because I think, especially um, when we had like, this past lockdown, when we had the Premier say, stay in your community, there were a lot of questions about what it is to be a community and what to do when your community doesn't look like other communities, when you don't have grocery stores and, and all these different things that are essential. Um, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about that theme and seeing the work that comes with it, um, because I think it is like we're realizing now just how crucial it is that so many of these underserved places are complete. Um, but then my question for you um, is, I'm, I know that you're talking about um, like immigration and how that might be affecting, especially housing, but um, what the plan might look like uh, for HRM. And I'm wondering if there's any way of measuring um, kind of um, people who are moving into HRM from other areas within Nova Scotia. And the reason I ask is that um, I'm from a rural community outside of the HRM. Um, that's where I grew up. And I know that within the last month, let's say that 10 to 15 people I know have moved to the HRM because of the housing crisis in other rural communities. Um, so it's affecting people across Nova Scotia. And the, the answer sometimes is to move to the more densely populated area where there's hopefully more housing. But I think we know as citizens that that's not always the answer. <laughs> it's, there's still a house, housing crisis here. And so I'm just wondering like, if, if there's any way of measuring that or I guess like accounting for that kind of interprovincial movement. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we have uh, been doing our sort of population and housing analysis using StatsCan data, and it actually does break it down from uh, international immigration, uh, Canada-wide immigration, like between provinces and around the province to uh, to Halifax. So we have, I mean, we have that information, and it is has been part of our analysis, and definitely something that we've been keeping an eye on. It's a uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon too, because as we are learning now that you can work fairly functionally from home will sort of the opposite effect happen. So um, it's definitely something that is interesting and we're happy that we have the access to the information so that we can sort of see what those impacts are. Great, thank you. No problem. Christine, uh, questions or comments? Yes, uh, I have a quick question. Firstly, I want to thank you for the presentation, Kathleen. And uh, about, uh, I review uh, the Theme seven, I'm just wondering uh, how can we ensure that uh, this agenda lands uh, when we talk about integrating community uh, facility and park as a, we are a women's advisory committee. And I think uh, early on we discussed with um, a UN safety, uh, UN safe city program. And, and I think it's uh, probably like a going forward, there's lots of opportunities for us to look into like, for example, a place like library and park, how can you be uh, safe and uh, for for women and also also consider like a woman from the immigrant uh, community as well. Uh, can I just interject here? So Christine, I think your, your question has to do with theme seven, right? Oh, uh, yes, sir. And, and uh, yeah, so that's okay, because Kathleen is going to speak in a little bit more detail yeah. about theme seven. So I'm just going to suggest that we ask Kathleen to do that now. And we'll come back to you for the first question on yeah. theme seven to kind of just, I don't know if Kathleen will remember exactly what your question is. I'll try to make sure I answer it while I'm okay. talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, and our time's uh, zipping along. So we're going to ask Kathleen to do the similar thing that she did with theme five. She's gonna give us a little bit more detail about that. And, we'll, and we can speak to theme, or three, theme seven. And then there will be time at the end to come back to any of the other themes. If you have comments or questions about any of the other themes that you want to, uh, you want to have some uh, um, input on. So let's uh, move it over to you, Kathleen, so you can talk about theme seven. 
sound good. Hopefully technology doesn't fail me. <laughs> oh, no, that's not what I meant from here. Yeah. <laughs> um, can everybody see this? I can. Okay. I can't speak for everybody, but Perfect. I think so. <laughs> I'm seeing some nods. It bodes well. <laughs> Um, so thank you guys. Uh, so theme seven uh, is integrating community uh, facilities and parks. Um, so we'll do a bit of a deeper dive in here as well. Um, so this theme identifies uh, the important role that parks and community facilities play in complete communities. Um, so I think as you guys have pointed out, obviously, uh, through COVID, we've definitely learned the importance of having access to uh, outdoor space uh, and, and uh, community facilities also help to bring people together, uh, can serve as gathering spaces, uh, as well as emergency facilities, all kinds of important roles that these types of, uh, of, of uses can play. Um, so for our, from our perspective, uh, the big role of, of com uh, community facilities and parks in the work that we are doing is ensuring that they are provided uh, in communities to ensure that they are complete. So uh, the first sort of group of these is indoor community facilities. So this, uh, the municipality provides a range of indoor community facilities, uh, ranging from, you know, um, town halls to community uh, gathering spaces to rec facilities. Um, and they're generally guided by the community facilities master plan, which was adopted in 2017. Um, it provides dr broad direction for the renewal and enhancement of HRM's recreation facilities, but it also identifies uh, what's called the hub and spoke model for recreation facilities. So essentially the idea is that throughout the municipality, there'll be large hub facilities that provide sort of a, a range of, of, of re uh, programs uh, and amenities. And then there'll be smaller facilities sort of spread around that hub facility to provide uh, smaller, more local based um, uh, amenities. Um, so we're going to continue to uh, implement the recommendations of the Community Facilities Master Plan uh, through this review, um, as well as take a look at recreation trends, demographics, community needs, and that, so try to incorporate uh, the, that information when we're looking at locating uh, growth, but also considering uh, the availability of community facilities in areas. Um, then we have a group of facilities that are uh, not uh, necessarily managed by uh, the municipality, but that have that community use that is also really important to consider when you're establishing a complete community. Uh, so, for example, libraries provide a vast range of free services and communal space, um, and they are managed by Halifax Public, Public Libraries, which is sort of an arm's length organization of the municipality. Um, and then we also have uh, the, the various school boards, uh, which are provincial organizations that uh, identify where schools are located in our communities. Uh, and then also emergency services. Uh, so police, fire, um, all kinds of different services that are necessary to ensure that our communities are safe. Uh, paramedic stations, things like uh, hospitals, all kinds of stuff. Um, and those are all run by various different organizations. Um, so our goal with this review is to take the locations of all of these various services that are so important to ensuring that our communities are safe uh, and uh, complete uh, and meet all of our needs uh, and consider their locations and work with these different organizations uh, when we are planning where growth and new development should be located. Um, sort of the more traditional park is the access to green space, uh, and they play such an important role. Uh, we're all very familiar now. Um, and uh, the big change that has happened since the last regional plan review is that we've completed the Halifax Green Network Plan. And that plan introduced a concept called the park spectrum, which basically identifies different types of parks, so local, small parks versus large regional parks, and all of them play a different role in communities. Um, so acknowledging the different types of parks, you can then develop level, what are called level of service standards. Um, so those will basic the level of service standards help to make plan to uh, plan and make decisions around what kinds of parks are required in communities, um, the size, the location, what kinds of programming is available. Um, and that will help to uh, ensure more equitable access uh, based on sort of the type of development that you're living in. So 
as I mentioned, we have to incorporate the park spectrum uh, and then from that develop our level of service standards. And those will help inform uh, changes that need to be made to the regional subdivision bylaw, which will essentially allow us to uh, ask for more park or ask for the parkland that we need based on the level of service standards uh, when we receive uh, subdivision applications. Um, we would also take a look at other policy tools like um, CCCs are a tool that we can use. I can't remember what they stand for. Um, but sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, as well as uh, density bonusing uh, to uh, allow us to uh, take advantage of more parkland dedication to help build up the supply of green space that we have for our communities. Uh, and then finally, wilderness parks are sort of this other big topic area under this theme. Um, so we're home to a network of municipally, provincially, and federally, as well as nonprofit owned parks and open spaces. Um, so wilderness parks are a specific type of park. They're largely uh, retained in their natural state and they offer passive access to nature. Uh, we have five main uh, wilderness parks that we work with in HRM. It's the Sandy Lake Regional Park, the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes area, the Wil Western Common Wilderness Common, uh, Shaw Wilderness Park, and McIntosh Run Regional Park. Um, and so through this, through this uh, review, we're going to uh, apply the open space and natural resources designations and the regional park zone to officially recognize the publicly owned lands that comprise these parks as parks. Uh, and we're going to work with other, continue to work with other levels of government and conservation groups to try to increase access to these open spaces. So that is the end of that one. And before I stop sharing, I just wanted to uh, sh share this slide very quickly. So this just gives you a very quick overview of the engagement that we're doing. Uh, we have our Sh Shape Your City page, obviously, uh, where you're all welcome to go and learn more and uh, complete a survey. We all will also be doing uh, virtual Q and A's. Uh, on a number of different topics. So if you're able to attend those, that would be wonderful. If you're not able to attend, we will be posting recordings of them on the website. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for your participation and for listening. And uh, I look forward to your questions. So Kathleen, are you, <clears throat> excuse me, are you able to answer Christine's uh, comment or question at this point, or do you need her to kind of restate her question? <laughs> So my understanding was it, it was like around like safety in accessing libraries and and uh, and other types of facilities. So I think um, and please feel free to redirect me if I'm focusing on the wrong thing. I think, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of these facilities, the, the libraries in particular, are designed are, are operated by our, our uh, Halifax Public Libraries organization, which is sort of an arm's length group. Um, but certainly, I think that having them be accessible uh, and central in the, com in the community um, allows more residents to have easy access to them and therefore creates more vibrant places where um, people feel comfortable going. Um, if there are specific concerns around safety, I think we can definitely, it would be interesting to learn about those um, and, and, and sort of pass them along. Um, Kate, Leah, I'm not sure if you guys have anything to add to that, or Christine, if I've I, even yeah. re remotely touched, answered your question. <laughs> no worries. Uh, is, uh, so uh, I think my my question or comment is uh, about, for example, when we design or like uh, this kind of facility or integrating some like an uh, age old uh, facility, like uh, do we consider with a uh, gender lens, especially uh, as a city of Halifax, we have the, uh, we are working on the UN uh, safe city program. So I'm thinking like uh, all this facility, not only like safety for everyone, do we consider with a uh, gender lens? Yeah, I can I can hop in here. So uh, I think I hear the question being sort of around how we use a, a gender based analysis in, in the work that we do. And so um, the regional plan is less about um, kind of planning those individual facilities themselves and more about the sort of um, big picture thinking about how we're planning community and where people are going to live and when they live, what sort of facilities do they need to support them. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a higher level exercise. Uh, we certainly have uh, 
been in touch with our friends in the diversity and inclusion office. And I think I saw Caroline Hemstock on the call here who was like introduced us to gender-based analysis. So it's, you know, it's um, kind of an ongoing conversation about like how we can continue to do this sort of uh, gender-based analysis work and where we're planning. But I mean, a big, a big part of it is this uh, complete community idea that I think another uh, one of the committee members raised where you know, it's, it's a bit about how we are um, structuring our communities where people are able to access things like, um, you know, like like schools and libraries and be able to get there in safe walking routes around their communities or um, using transit. So uh, there's sort of a, di a few different ways that we can get at it. But our, our work is generally kind of high level about community building. It's a bit of a city building exercise. And, and then the, the facilities themselves are planned at a later stage. Thanks, uh, Lee, and thanks, Kathleen. So <clears throat> we have about um, uh, about 10 more minutes to, uh, no, sorry, a little bit longer than that, to talk about uh, and to provide feedback. So I'm going to go back around, but I'm going to go backwards. So I'm going to go to Holly. I know you had other questions about theme five. So use your time to talk about theme five, theme seven, or any of the other themes that you would like to speak to. Sure. Um... So I guess I two questions. Um, so in general, I was wondering um, if or if and how intersectionality um, would be considered in consultations, um, because I think uh, it's important like to name like the groups that we're, you're going to be looking at, um, but also to consider how those groups intersect with each other. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about and kind of similar to what uh, Charlotte was talking about, but there's many like um, racialized communities or um, immig immigrant communities in particular, different pockets in HRM, um, and especially being a woman of color might be different than just looking at uh, those groups individually. So I'm just wondering how that will be considered. Um, thank you for your question. I think uh, I'm not going to, uh, because the engagement guidebook is still under development, um, I, I don't honestly know the answer to your question yet. Uh, it is being managed by our Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and that's certainly a lens that we can take to uh, looking at it once we have sort of the version that we're going to be moving forward with, or sorry, before we move forward with it, we can, you know, take a look at how, how that's been incorporated into it. Um, but where I haven't uh, seen the draft of it yet, I don't want to necessarily say that it has or has not been considered, um, but it, I, I appreciate the comments and I'll definitely take a look into that. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And yeah. Um, my other question was in terms of public facilities, I was wondering if um, like public washrooms are considered as a, a facility. Um, and the reason I ask is that I, I think mm. it's important in terms of accessibility. Um, we see a lot of people who are housing insecure, especially with COVID when restaurants were shut down, like Tim Hortons, the library was shut down. There's no place for them to wash their hands, to use the washroom. Um, but as well, from an accessibility perspective, like I'm someone who lives with a, a digestive disease and I can't go places if there are no public washrooms. And so that's been an, an added kind of burden in some sense. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that I know a lot of people rely on when they're going out in their communities. So I was just wondering if, if that is something that's being considered at all. That's a really interesting comment. And I think... Um... It would be interesting to take a look and uh, definitely something we can look at moving forward is whether or not it's been considered in the community facilities master plan uh, in the scope that it looks at. Um, and if it hasn't, I think that that would be something very interesting for us to flag moving forward. Thanks. I, I think um, I'll just hop in to say, I think that there was recently our, our colleagues in Parks and Recreation brought forward a public wa park washrooms and drinking fountain yeah. strategy. But I'm not familiar enough with that work to speak to it, but. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think that's a, a great comment. Um, they're, you know, really important facilities to have. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, Mallory, is there anything you would like to ask or comment on at this point? Holly, that's such a good point that I honestly didn't think about until you raised it. And that's something that I struggle with too. Um, and I do have to plan my out outings based on washrooms and um, I can't remember is there an app specifically for washrooms or did I see it somewhere that I found online I've either been able to see a printed map where there is public washrooms wherever you go or if there isn't an app we should make an app but 
Thank you. That's all. And, and just something like uh, a, a fact, just for people to know that Nova Scotia actually has the highest prevalence of digestive disease in the world. Um, this region, um, Canada is one of the highest, like one of the highest countries, but Nova Scotia in particular. Um, so it's just something that um, I think it's important to consider because it it's not talked about, but it impacts so many people. I think there is data in our open mapping um, system. So I, I think it is mapped. Um, and I can see someone putting in the chat, yeah, that all HRM washrooms are on open data, but there isn't an app. So yeah, great. Great, great, great comments, Sarah Holly. Thank you. Uh, Charla, would you like to add any comments or No, nothing for me, sorry. I was trying to figure out what my little button was. <laughs> Tanya, how about you? Would you like to uh, add anything or make comments? Um, just one quick one. Um, for regard In regards to parks, um, will there be a, a, a template for parks? And obviously every green space is different, um, but and it may fall into somebody else's hands, but will there be a template for how we structure our parks? Um, specifically, I look at all the parks across the, the city that I can frequent and the like the Titus Memorial Park is in my neighborhood and I see the different ways that people interact with that park. And I really, I really like seeing people there. Um, and coming back to uh, what Christine was saying as well um, about the UN Safe Cities, kind of about the, the lighting obstructions and usability of parks. So will there be a template that um, these green spaces can follow to ensure that they meet all of the standards kind of as often as possible? Thank you. Um... I think that uh, from a regional plan perspective, what the level of service standards will really do is just um, provide some expectations around sort of what the size and type of park and like what the distance is from that park from any given community and sort of how well serviced in terms of the different types of parks the different communities are. It won't go into as much detail about like what the programming of those parks are. It may have some recommendations around like, you need this amenity because there isn't any in this community or there things like that. Um, but it would be more about sort of the level of, of the service and not the design of the parks themselves, or sorry, the level of service in terms of the location, the size, the amenities, not necessarily about the design themselves. Um, certainly I, I won't speak on behalf of the parks department because they ultimately do the design and planning for their parks sort of on an individual basis, but I believe that they try to work with the community as much as possible to sort of determine those things that you, that you would be referencing. Okay, thanks Kathleen. And um, Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, no questions from me at this time, but uh, I can confirm the, uh, the earlier question. Uh, Parks and Rec are actually in the process right now of putting together a public washroom strategy that's going to look at public washroom, not just uh, from HRM, but also looking at uh, what is available to the public from uh, private uh, establishments. So uh, that is something that is currently, and I think they started in February 2020. So I, I can't confirm that that work is uh, is currently underway. Thanks for that information. Uh, and Lily, I think you had some questions that were left over from the last time. So here you go. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I guess this is half a comment, half a question um, about the previous theme five on food security, as I was just you know, thinking of how the burden of food insecurity is often more heavily placed on the shoulders of women in their households. Um, and also, uh, so like I'm wondering if that's a, a lens that's being considered and how to like lessen and the burden on women and also make you know, urban agriculture or um, different methods of increasing food security more accessible to women, especially, you know, as since women do a lot of unpaid labor and emotional labor around the household and, and with their families. Um, and my other question about or comment about food security is that I also think it's really important to consider 
the food insecurity that students and youth in the city experience um, because especially during COVID I know like I have friends who run the Dow Food Bank and they've seen an exponential increase in students and young people accessing the food bank services um, and especially international students and students that may not have as much English or as easy access to other services in the city um, so I guess like is there any um, consideration currently to making sure that you know the food um, security work is both like working to make it more accessible for women but also youth and students. I, think I, I can jump in here and say yeah I'm, I'm happy to <laughs> speak to that one just briefly I think probably the best thing to do is uh, to plug the ongoing just food action plan so they are at shapeyourcityhalifax.ca slash food action. And the engagement is ongoing. Uh, the planner there is Leticia Smiley. And um, and I, I have no doubt that she is considering uh, all of those lenses in that work. And they're working together with the Halifax Food, food Policy Alliance. So it's sort of broader than just HRM uh, working on that work. But there's like definitely opportunities for um, engaging on that uh, moving on. So, you know, um, we could certainly ask uh, you know that that they could come present at this committee if you're interested and that's that's probably a good way forward there thank you leah and lily uh and uh hanin any comments or questions at this time i do have one comment actually about this theme so you did mention kathleen that um you don't necessarily cover the design of the parks and such, but you do cover the size and so on. But so with community centers, uh, speaking on, you know, with immigrants and specifically Muslims, we do, women tend to have a very tough time finding like places for us to go and, you know, meet up and sit down together because we can't actually ever take off our headscarf. Um, so it makes things very difficult. Um, so a lot of Muslim women tend to not be able to actually use community centers um, or just feel like it's a lot more difficult for them to use it. So that's been an issue that's been very prevalent in the community. Um, so maybe that's something to keep in mind. I don't know if it falls under you or somebody else, but something else can happen. Yeah, I, I should clarify that. Uh, thank you for that comment. That's such an interesting thing to, to bear in mind when we're talking about these, these types of, of facilities. Um, I think that uh, I should clarify that it wouldn't necessarily be the regional plan doing this work so much as our parks uh, our, our friends in Parks and Recreation who are going to be doing that work and sort of bringing it forward to be considered through the regional plan review. So I don't want to speak too much on their behalf, um, but certainly all of the information that we've gotten here, we will be passing along to the people who need to hear it. So um, I, I appreciate the comment. Thank you. Thanks, Amin. So uh, any other um, comments or questions from anybody on any aspect of the regional plan? So um, just as the kind of uh, then I'll take the opportunity to just make a comment and just to um, echo uh, some of the members comments um, and concerns that the, you know, gender lens be applied. Obviously, we are the Women's Advisory Committee of the city of Halifax, um, the city deemed it deemed the concerns of women significant enough to have a, have a committee formed to address these issues. So it seems to me it behooves the strategic planning group to really consider the needs of women as it, as it moves forward. And, um, and you know, I appreciate Leah what, no, I think it was Kate, you talked about affordability of housing and not wanting to discriminate, but we're also aware that uh, housing affordability issues are particularly important for women. That women, the, the most recent reports shows us that women are particularly negatively impacted. And then of course, we've got all this intersectionality when we talk about immigrant women, women or racialized women or African women. Um, so, it's, so it's women have a particularly difficult time, I think. And um, so, and I did notice in the plan, uh, in, the, in the comments or in sections, 
you did refer to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which is great, which you know is our staff uh, you know, counterpart. But to me, it would make sense that you might also refer to the Women's Advisory Committee, that, you, that they be an organization with whom you consult, just like the Accessibility Advisory Committee is, re is referred to specifically in the plan. And um, so I would just uh, encourage that inclusion. Tracy, I think, wants to comment here. Tracy, go for it. Raised my hand by mistake. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So, um, so that was just uh, just my um, comment to to recognize that you know when the strategic plan uh, was initiated back in two thousand and six, the women's advisory committee wasn't here. When they did the when you did the first review of it, the women's advisory committee wasn't here. But now we are here and hope that we will uh, be recognized uh, going forward as an organization, as a committee that needs to have its voice heard. And to that end, we're very grateful for this opportunity to be able to talk directly with you and to have some, to have some input here. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. I think, you know, you've raised a lot of, um, valuable insights that we'll take back and we will try to build into our framework. I think, you know, we're, it's such a broad area that uh, we're always um, needing reminders. It's such a broad topic area. We're always needing reminders about how we can think about all people and everyone is different as you point out, Jane. So I appreciate that, that uh, uh, what, what you said there and that we need to think about intersectionality and, um, you know, certainly I don't want to also suggest that we we need to wait for the diversity and inclusion office to do everything for us. We certainly want to do that ourselves. So we take your guidance and we've heard a lot of what you've said today and we'll try to build it into our work and keep doing that and keep coming back to you. So uh, any any guidance or ideas or suggestions are, are welcome at any time. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kathleen, uh, for leading us in this uh, conversation and Leah and Kate for your uh, participation in responding to our questions and our comments. And thank you committee members for your, for your thoughtful comments and your input. So um, we will move on now. Oh, I should just say just in terms of the next steps, um, we will see the comments written up in our minutes and uh, between the committee members, we will um, look at this again, I expect in the July meeting and that will give us an opportunity to think about how we might do a written response. Because I think Kathleen said that you would accept written uh, comments from us uh, to up until the middle of July. Would that be correct? Would you accept them up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our, our, for everyone's information, the survey is going to be open and active until July 16th, but we, due to scheduling, are still going to be see, visiting committees uh, probably until the end of July. So uh, if you guys are um, taking a look at uh, the presentation and the content further and would like to submit sort of supplemental information to us as a committee, um, we are certainly happy to receive it. Thank you, thank you. So we'll, re we'll consider this again in our July meeting. So thank you very much for that. All right. Thank um, you very much. You're welcome. Uh, our next item is uh, an update from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And uh, Caroline uh, is going to do that, item 9.1.2. And also uh, then there's the 9.1.3 um, items too. So uh, Caroline, are you doing both of those or just one? Tracy doing the other. I'll I'll just do the first item. Okay. Which is easy because I don't have anything to update at this time, Chair. Okay, thank you. So no no <laughs> update on the uh, GBA analysis plus. Thanks, uh, Tracy Jones Grant. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of uh, updates for the committee. I am so pleased to say that the accessibility passed through count the accessibility strategy passed through council um, last week. It was a wonderful conversation with council, and um, we're very pleased to be on the road to moving the accessibility strategy forward. 
On Tuesday, I will be bringing forward to council the anti-Black racism strategy um, and action plan. So that's pretty exciting moving that work forward. And I, um, the only other thing that I wanted to sort of bring to people's attention is that June is considered Indigenous Peoples Month. And as we think about all that's happened um, with the discovery of the 215 children's bodies, we're assuming children's bodies, um, and all that we're hearing from our Indigenous peoples across this country, the office is continuing to do more work through our Indigenous advisor, Cheryl copage Um, City has done some things, and we're going beyond, you know, the lowering of the flags and the coloring of, of buildings. Um, we've, uh, Cheryl just recently has met with the, the, the mayor, the CAO, uh, some chiefs to really talk about uh, what work HRM is doing and what we are doing with respect to our commitment to truth and reconciliation. So um, I imagine that I'll be bringing more back to this committee as we look at that, um, that work. That's my update. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, important, important work there. Um, and so that takes us to Councillor Blackburn. At this point, um, it's your opportunity to provide us an update on what City Council's up to. All right, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So we've had uh, two regional council meetings since we last met. Uh, May 4th at that meeting, we started the process to establish a heritage district in downtown Halifax. So this move actually follows the establishment of other heritage districts such as Schmidtville and Barrington Street, uh, following along the same process. We also approved the operating budget, amended capital budget, and the tax rates for uh, fiscal 2021-22. In total, it includes $833 million in municipal expenditures. The uh, residential tax rate will increase by 1%, uh, and that will mean that the average single-family home tax bill will increase by about $21 as a result. Regional Council also approving uh, the proposed amendments to the uh, planning strategy and the Coal Harbor Westfall land use bylaws to allow the development of the former site of the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children. Acoma Holdings is proposing um, a project that will enable a mix of housing, economic and recreational activities for the community. And uh, Acoma is actually guided by Afrocentric principles of Kwanzaa, the uh, community's need for affordable housing, cultural preservation and socio economic development and environmental stewardship. So uh, we look forward to ACOMA moving forward with their plans there. At the May 18th Regional Council meeting, we approved a motion to expand the first pilot phase of the student transit pilot program. And this program is going to include students in grades nine through 12 at uh, four schools. And the objective here is to create a permanent program that will be offered to all middle and high school students served by Halifax Transit. And the option or the, uh, the, the goal here is to make transit an affordable and accessible option for students. As Tracy just mentioned, the uh, accessibility strategy was passed. Uh, we also passed first reading to uh, the uh, taxi and limousine bylaw T1005. So these changes will allow a committee to be established that will be made up of members from the legal community. And uh, what they will be doing is hearing appeals of taxi licenses. Uh, and that would uh, divert uh, those cases from going to the, uh, the appeals committee. Also approved was a request to uh, amend the, uh, the administrative order that oversees our Women's Advisory Committee. Uh, so that allowed uh, racialized women to be added to the complement of individuals on the committee. We discussed the establishment of a disc, uh, disc golf course at Northwood Psych Community Center. Uh, now that lo uh, location was actually rejected at this time but Parks and Rec uh, committing at that meeting to study possible locations throughout HRM for that uh, growing sport. Uh, council voting to freeze uh, council uh, members pay again in 2021 in recognition of the ongoing pandemic. And uh, finally, the, uh, the the best part of the year is uh, when we, uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality, the Citizenship Awards are presented. And these are given out each year to outstanding grade nine students 
students throughout the municipality. Each school has only one award recipient and the schools actually choose the award recipient based on leadership qualities, service in the school and the community and their academic performance. And the recipients uh, get a special plaque with the HRM crest on it, along with their name and the year engraved. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do this in person this year, so the plaques were mailed out because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is the latest report from Halifax Regional Council. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn. Any questions or comments for Councillor Blackburn? We're all good. All, good. all right. And with that, I will uh, leave to go off to my other uh, appointment. Thank you so very much uh, and uh, looking forward to the July meeting. Yeah, we'll see you then. Thanks a lot. All right. And that brings us to item 9.2.1 um, which are, and 9.2.2, .2, which are two motions that Christine and Holly and Tanya, is that right, worked on very very diligently over the last, not not Tanya. Yeah. Yes, we have a meeting and a discussion together. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Christine uh, is going to bring these uh, motions forward for us. To yeah. So before I do that, I just want to thank everyone for your support on idea presentation on the anti-Asian, how to combating anti-Asian racism and uh, this uh, topic to the uh, executive standing committee of HIM. And then uh, it was well received and, uh, and uh, less on good feedback. And uh, also CBC, I think they also future their presentations. So I'm very glad this matter is uh, getting an attention. And thank you very much. So um, I hope you have a chance to review the two uh, kind of recommendation form. And Jen, maybe I should just uh, straightforward to read the motion. Yes, yes. Okay, and the first one is about um, collecting anti-Asian racism uh, data with a gender-based data collection. Uh, so I move that uh, women's advisor, uh, I recommend that the women's advisory committee recommend Executive Standing Committee recommend that uh, Regional Council request the Chief Administrative Officer through the UN Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces Program to consider the impact of anti-Asian racism on women's experience of safety in public spaces and explore ways to identify and collect race-based data about this experience. Oh, you're on mute, Jen. Yeah. Thank you. I'll uh, call for a seconder and then we can discuss the motion. So is somebody prepared to second this motion? I'll second. Uh, seconded by Holly Matthias. So now any uh, questions or comments um, for Christine or Holly? Christine, I think we're good. People have done their homework. They've read the rationale. They've read the motion. And are you ready for the question? Are you ready to vote? All right, we need to vote. I almost Ready forgot. to vote, everybody? Okay, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 If you're opposed, indicate by saying nay. So the motion is carried. Okay, moving on to the next motion, Christine. Yeah, so the second motion is about uh, providing information resource to support safety of uh, women of Asian descent. So uh, I put forward a mo motion that the Women's Advisory Committee recommend Executive Standing Committee request a staff report on the provision of information resource to support the safety of uh, women of Asian descent in public spaces in the Halifax region. Thank you. And uh, could I have a seconder for that motion? I'll second. second. And seconded by Charla Dorrington. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? Seeing shaking heads. Uh, ready for the question? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, indicate by saying nay. The motion is carried. 
Thank you, so, everyone. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for all your hard work on this issue, uh, Christine, and for leading the charge. Very appreciate that very much. So that brings us to item 10, which is if there were any added items, um, there being no added items, the only item of business we need to deal with is our next, when our next meeting is, and that will take place on July 8th. Uh, 2021. At that time, we will have another um, uh, speaker on immigration, uh, f finish up our conversation that we've had about immigration. And I think if there's time, um, uh, Lily has recommended that we uh, move ahead with doing something on climate change and had some suggestions there. And so we'll be looking at trying to um, deal with that topic as well. Christine, did you want to add here? Uh, yes, uh, just one comment. Earlier, I think uh, Councillor uh, Blackburn at the chat function, she recommends that maybe well worthwhile to invite uh, the CEO of uh, Halifax Library to present to our committee as the library playing a very important role in the city. And uh, uh, there are many women using these uh, all the facilities. Right. Okay, so we'll, I, I did see that and uh, we'll take that into consideration for possible next meetings. I think uh, there's other uh, meeting, other suggestions. I remember a while ago, Christine, you talked about um, perhaps connecting with, I think the Provincial Council of Women, is that correct? Uh, so there, yes. are other, there are other topics and uh, items for, for future meetings and uh, we'll be, trying to incorporate that those ideas into into subsequent meetings. So thank you for that. Then there being nothing further, I just need a motion to adjourn. I will make the motion to adjourn our meeting. Thank you, Holly. So the meeting is adjourned.